our dear friends Scott McAllister and Gregory McGrew for this opportunity to share our testimonies and our history as a local assembly with our friends that we're going to soon be meeting in South Africa. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Raleigh and Amanda Bays at Canaan Ministries, and of course their administrative assistant, uh, Colette, uh, for all the hard work that they are doing behind the scenes to make this uh, conference possible. Uh, the purpose of this particular interview is just to uh, get a, an outline as to why we're, we're coming there. Um, we understand that there is, uh, there are, I should say, a number of counselors and pastors and therapists that have been working with uh, satanic ritual abuse survivors for a number of years. And um, when they heard the Nephilim Mother interviews, as they've come to be called, on the Bite Show, uh, the report was that um, this is the missing piece that uh, they've been looking for in terms of uh, helping people understand uh, the problems we're dealing with. Uh, I think in this uh, beginning session, and I really appreciate my wife, Lori, sitting in, she's probably kind of nervous, but she'll survive, um, is that uh, our history as a church, we began by uh, just as, as, a, as a Bible church, um, we began to teach God's eternal purpose. Um, we spent two years in uh, teaching the book of Ephesians, verse by verse, uh, probably uh, two and a half, three hours every Sunday. And out from that, uh, a church began to uh, grow. And by 1980, this was in 1980, and then in 1983, we became uh, an assembly and God directed us to uh, call our church or name our church Morning Star Testimony, which has, a, it has its own history, taken out of 2 Peter 1:19. And as we began to just uh, teach the Word of God, believing that people being grounded in the Word was uh, sufficient to resolve every issue and problem, and we still believe that, but it comes to the application. How do we apply the truth? And after several years of uh, teaching the Word, uh, it became apparent that a number of our people had, had very uh, severe problems. Uh, they, they had occult issues in terms of their background, uh, having a difficulty hearing the Word, uh, we did not even understand that uh, until later on that these people, uh, many of them were cult active. In other words, they were attending church, <clears throat> Bible study, uh, etc., but uh, going to rituals because they were dissociated, that is, uh, parts, uh, parts of themselves through trauma uh, were programmed to go to rituals and serve uh, that which is uh, establishing the kingdom of Antichrist in our generation. So it's a, it's a real... Uh, pleasure to be able to come to South Africa and to meet you people and we are trusting the Lord to to be able to impart some of our history uh, to you, to you workers as well as survivors um, in order to just hopefully help to facilitate their healing and their restoration and their function. Um, I would like to say uh, with reference to my wife, if it had not been her for her faithfulness and her standing by my side all these years. Um, I know I would not be here, and that's, that, that's, I'm very serious about that, so I'm very grateful to the Lord for giving me the wife that I have. And uh, this has been a real warfare. I mean, this is, not, uh, this is not a pretty picture. When you get into uh, satanic ritual abuse and the new, whole New World Order agenda that is, of course, unfolding right before our eyes. Uh, and so uh, I really appreciate Lori's uh, faithfulness and her part and um, being by my side uh, through the years. Um, I think in this introduction, uh, we'll just give an overview of um, the people that we're working with. Uh, we had people come to us from various parts of the country as we were an early church. Um, as I said earlier, they had struggles and they had difficulties in, in various areas. And we began to, to, to you know, just do basic counseling, biblical counseling. And some are getting better and some are not. And this is around the mid uh, 1980s. Uh, some of the people were manifesting spirits and I didn't have a theology for that. Uh, it, we, we got into counseling and there was a cold bondage. Uh, and yet uh, through those uh, five year window of 1985 to about 1990, 1991, there still was not a resolution and uh, with some. And so I, I read a book, uh, that came, it was released in 1991, it was called, uh, it is called, I should say, Uncovering the Mystery of MPD, Multiple Personality Disorder. 
written by uh, Dr. James Friesen. When I read that, it began to uncover some of the um, mi missing pieces because trauma, chronic trauma in early childhood causes the identity to split and therefore when it's purposely caused, it creates uh, an opportunity for the enemy to invade that person's life and of course the programmers uh, purposely perpetrate the trauma in order to, uh, to structure in an agenda and ultimately to bring in the Antichrist and uh, to bring in the New World Order. This is a summarization of, of course, uh, many, many years of work. We have been doing this work now for 27 years with uh, <clears throat> ritual abuse survivors. Um, we, as I said, 1991, we uh, discovered the dissociative component, that is the multiple personality, which is now called a dissociative identity disorder. We discovered that in 1991. So we've been working with uh, that particular phenomenon for about 21 years now. And I think what we've gained is an assembly, not as a counseling center, not as a, um, you know, just as uh, counselors, but as a local church. Uh, God has uh, granted us, uh, I think, uh, the privilege uh, to be able to get, gain some insights that you would not gain in any other venue. And that's what I, uh, I, we're hoping and trusting the Lord that when we come to South Africa, there'll be six, six of us going, uh, that what we share uh, is going to be something that is unique in that it, it encompasses uh, uh, a whole lifetime of, of people that have come out of the cult. And, so, and, and some of these people are miraculously restored. But it, the impo important thing is that it didn't happen overnight. It's a long journey. Um, so I would like, Lori, if you have any thoughts or comments as to why uh, you're coming with me, and of course I asked you to come, but uh, anything you would like to say to the people uh, that uh, we're going to be meeting in South Africa and working with, I should say. Okay, well thank you for having us and we're really looking forward to meeting each and every one of you and connecting, not just for this short period of time, but maybe for a lifetime and into eternity. Um, I just want to say that I was thinking about this yesterday and, and wondering what I would say kind of as a whole overview. And I would say that probably without myself without being involved in these folks' lives, which has been a, a huge challenge and continues to be, I wouldn't know the Lord and I wouldn't be coming to know Him uh, the way that I am. It is anyone that uh, is willing to go into a pit with the lion on a snowy day, like one of David's mighty men did. Um, anyone who's willing to do that by God's grace alone will find that you, you discover jewels. You discover jewels that have been waiting in God to be discovered. And so I, I see this all as an opportunity to come to know the living God and to make Him known in a way that otherwise, uh, I don't know, perhaps would have been remained hidden in God forever. So it's been a privilege, it's been hellacious, it continues to be um, a walk that casts myself and, and, and Doug completely upon the Lord. We don't ever feel like we've arrived in our understanding. We don't ever feel that we're the pros, uh, that we have it all, that we have all the answers. There's one that has the answers, that is the answer, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. So years ago, when I was a baby Christian, just beginning my walk with the Lord, I, I asked the Lord, I said, I want to know you as you really are. And little did I know that that prayer was birthed in His heart and planted in my own, and that in asking the Lord that and in Him answering, I would have to know a little bit of what he knows and that's the honor he's granted me to know him i have to know what he knows obviously i'm not omniscient i'm not all-knowing but this type of evil that is in the world that's been perpetrated upon god's very own beloved ones it, you know it, it's just a it's where you come to know what's been in his heart. 
and that He is a suffering God. We, we know Him as the most blessed God, but He's also the greatest sufferer of the universe. And He's allowing us, He's been waiting for a handful of people, a remnant of people to walk with Him into this darkness and to, to declare, Satan, you're losing. Satan, you have lost by the cross of Calvary. And Satan, these people aren't going to be in your grip anymore. And um, to, to take back the ground that the adversary, the usurper, has stolen. And so that's, I mean, that's just in a nutshell what I feel like I have gained, and I see all of us gaining that. It's, this is not an individual thing, it is a corporate thing. This has to do not with an individual walk, albeit it is individual, but with the body of Christ. And so I praise the Lord for this, though just the other day I said, I don't like it, Lord. I don't like this calling, but I submit. I, I mean, after 20 some years, I'm still saying, I can't stand this. It's so painful. It's so ugly. I wish it wasn't true. But then stepping back out of that denial and, and saying, but Lord, you know, and you're perfect in all of your ways and you're kind in all of your doings. So I bow before you, I worship you. I continue to submit and say yes to you, Lord, all the way through. And so that's what it's meant to me, just in a nutshell. Yeah, thank you. That's uh, very important for all of you that'll be meeting us and uh, hearing us speak uh, to recognize the context is God's eternal purpose. Uh, God is on his throne. He is working all things after the counsel of his will. His throne is from generation to generation, as it says in Lamentation 519. And so in his sovereignty, he has allowed evil to play out its final um, its final move in these last days. This is the end game. And uh, what you're going to be hearing, uh, you will not hear in the psychology class, although uh, we have been uh, trained in trauma, and some of the, uh, I have anyway, and I understand the psychological dynamics. I can talk to you as therapists, if you are therapists. Um, but there's a spiritual framework that uh, you're not going to get in any university or graduate course. And so you don't necessarily have to throw all that other way. You, you'll have a broader context. And as you meet these people in flesh and blood, you're going to, you're going to see the testimony, the reality of what they've gone through. Uh, if you were to be studying the Holocaust, for example, and you were to meet people who were historians writing on the Holocaust and debating whether it ever happened or not, uh, you or uh, you you wouldn't uh, uh, go to them. Uh, you might want to go to some of those who are the liberators of the Holocaust camps and meet with them and see what they saw with their own eyes. Uh, whether it's the, the, the survivors of uh, the uh, the military that went in, or uh, meet some of the Nazi guards that were there, uh, you could go to them. But that's all secondhand information, and it could have value. But if you want to really find out what happened in the Holocaust, you go to talk to the Holocaust survivors. You meet them, you spend time with them. You don't go to the the, the, the so-called experts, they may have some historical background that'll help you. Go to the witnesses. We're gonna bring you witnesses of the current hybrid breeding program that's been going on since post-World War II. Um, the, the UFO phenomenon, some of it is demonic, and some of it is real hardware, and it's being used for a purpose. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about events that have gone on on a global uh, scale, the UN, uh, centering in Jerusalem, uh, the sanctuary of, uh, of satanic rituals that are going on in North Korea. These are all reports that we've heard through the years. And so you're going to be able to uh, hear some of the context, but more importantly, what does it take for these people to come to freedom? What does it take for them to come to maturity in Christ? What does it come, what does it take for someone who is so polyfragmented in terms of their identity through the most severe and chronic trauma imaginable? to come to a place where James 1.4 uh, defines as whole, complete, and lacking in nothing. And so that's our intention of coming to, to be with you, uh, have fellowship with you, meet with you, get, learn from you as to what you have um, learned in your journey, and hopefully to encourage you as counselors and, and those that are working in this field too, that this is a sharing in Christ's sufferings. And so it is a, it is a worthy battle and uh, we have, we'll have a lot more to share, but perhaps this is enough 
uh, for our introduction uh, and before we we'll actually be interviewing uh, uh, the survivors tomorrow in which uh, it'll be made available in the future uh, as a separate uh, or a part of this particular uh, documentary so um, we just uh, are very grateful for this opportunity and many thanks to uh, the kind folks at Canaan Ministries for inviting us to South Africa and so we uh, we'll just commit this to the Lord and be praying for you before we get there and we trust you'll be praying for us so many blessings upon you all and Well, it's my pleasure to <clears throat> introduce uh, the Fear Saints of Morningstar that are a part of this uh, documentary project and actually the, the real, they're the real core of it. I come along as a voice and try to give a biblical framework and been their pastor, but when it comes to the witnesses and it comes to the really core of the message that uh, we want to uh, share with our friends in South Africa and all those that will be viewing this in the future, these are the testimonies. These are the witnesses. So, uh, Susan, uh, you would introduce yourself and we'll just go around and then uh, we will continue on with our time. My bloodline name is Susanna Oldenburg and um, my father was of the European bloodline monarchy and my mother was of the Russian bloodline. I am Sarah Elisheva and that's my bloodline name. I am daughter of Joseph from the tribe of Dan and Levi, and also the 13 bloodlines through a genetic manipulation. My name is Jennifer Diane, and I'm not from a specific royal bloodline, but um, it was more just structured in a spiritual way to be a convergence of what the other bloodlines represented. Be a, be a gateway uh, to, uh, to Genesis 6-2 in this generation. Right. <clears throat> Thank you. My name is Juliana. Um, I'm of the European bloodline. My mother was um, Saxe Coburg Gotha of the Windsor line. <coughs> and my father was one of her sons. I'm Constantina Honor Rudy Alexandra Elizabeth, and um, I have a, a mother of European uh, royalty, but my father is not. He was um, brought into flow, like the Genesis 6 uh, project and a lot of other things, so I, that, that side of it is not bloodline, the royal bloodline. It's a new, new creation of foundation for a new bloodline, I guess. I'm Christina. Um, my mother was a Gentile European bloodline, and my father was Jewish. Um, and like Sally from the tribe of Dan, and also the 13 kings of the earth bloodlines spliced into that, so it is kind of like a convergence too as well, only on the Jewish side. And my name's Peter. Um, I'm part of the new bloodline that they're talking about. Um, that's what like we worked the other day, uh, there was you were created to be a shield, a shield for Satan in some respects. Yeah, yeah thank you. Well, my my, uh, my American name is Daniel Smith. My European name is Daniel Michael George Alexander Collins. Uh, the Collins is a hidden name from the House of Windsor, which is originally from. Saxophone uh, bloodline that uh, represents, uh, in my case, the combination of the 13 primary European or Germanic uh, bloodlines brought into one, uh, one single focus. Okay, yes. Well, thank you. <clears throat> We're going to be uh, talking about um, issues and that which refers to uh, conception events, even preconception events and rituals. Uh, events that occur at birth. Um, you might ask the question, how could anybody know this? If anyone understands the development of cognitive memory in terms of brain function, uh, you all know that 18 months is, is where it really begins in terms of brain function, in terms of the ability to uh, start to retain cognitive memory. 
<coughs> excuse me, um, we're not talking about cognitive memory uh, based upon brain function. Uh, what these people are going to be sharing with you is a, a level of knowing that is clearly defined in the Word of God. And uh, that uh, reference, and this is just a brief uh, um, uh, overview of this, because I, we don't have time to go into this in, in the detail that it deserves. But I will say this, as a counselor, and those who are counselors and therapists that may w view this in the, in the future, if you do not know the difference between the function of Neshama and how that's targeted by Satan in the process of abuse, then your level of penetrating the layers of uh, the DID structures will be limited. Uh, the knowledge of how to identify and know the function of, uh, uh, of a Neshama in a person's um, per, uh, DID structure is absolutely vital and critical to see them resolved. So uh, what they're going to be sharing with you comes out of a Neshama knowledge. And you say, what's a Neshama? Um, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, God formed Adam from the dust of the earth, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. It's in the plural for extension, most likely comprehensive. It's life in its fullness. And man became a living nephesh, a living soul. So when he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, that inbreathed life of God, that's neshama. Now, what, what is neshama? It's closely related to the human spirit. But it's defined uh, in particular in Proverbs 20, verse 27. Your translations may translate the word as spirit, but it's not spirit. The Hebrew word for spirit is ruach. This particular word in uh, Proverbs 20, 27 is nashama, that inbreathed life. For us, as descendants of Adam, that comes in right at conception, but as soon as conception occurs, the sin nature inherited from Adam puts the, the, the nashama dies. So it becomes a domain and access of the adversary. Uh, and it is not regenerated until new birth. And that's why it's targeted in, in the rituals in such a specific way. But in Proverbs 20, verse 27, it says, The neshama of man is the lamp of the Lord. It's the lamp of Yahweh. Notice, searching all the innermost parts of a man's being. Uh, the attributes of neshama are found in uh, uh, Deuteronomy, not Deuteronomy, excuse me, in uh, Job. Chapter 32, uh, verse 8, uh, which, um, uh, uh, let's see, it's not in here, so we'll just look it up. Job 32, 8, I'll just read that real quickly. And then those that want to um, read the paper that I wrote on this, uh, I'll refer you to the website. Uh, in Job 32, 8, Elihu, responding to Job's three friends and Job at the end of Job's discourse, um, he says in verse 7, I thought age should speak. You know, Elihu is speaking to Bil, uh, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. Increased years should teach wisdom, but it is a ruach in man. That would be pneuma in the Greek New Testament. It is a ruach in man, and the breath of the Almighty gives them being, understanding, discrimination. So that second term there, breath, is the inbreathed life of God. And notice, it gives them understanding. It gives them understanding. That's very important. Uh, Job um, 33 and verse uh, 4 it says that the Spirit of God has made me, and the neshama, the inbreathed life of God, the Almighty, gives me life. So the center of life is there. It gives me understanding. Um, we could look at other verses, but um, we are not going to be able to do that at this time. I will refer you to our website, which is dougriggs.org. If you go into the uh, tab in the upper part of the page, S-R-A-D-I-D, if you scroll down uh, to the articles that I've written, the most recent one I've done is titled Understanding the Validity and Nature of Traumatic Memories Within the Context of Biblical Epistemology and Anthropology. Uh, you know, how do you, how do we, epistemology, how do we know what we know? Okay, so you're going to be hearing testimonies that is, that is beyond the ability for one to, uh, drawn from cognitive memory. But the neshama in union with the Holy Spirit uh, what we, uh, is the outcome of that which reveals what was hidden in darkness. And now when it comes to light, there can be redemption. With most of us that don't have a trauma history, we don't have to uh, know the kind of things that these people know. 
But in order for people to go free, they got to know what happened to them. And what happened to them, it was so much on a supernatural level. It happened in preconception. Uh, and of course, it happened uh, in the womb. It happened right at birth. How is anyone going to know that? Well, God is ever-present. In fact, the God of Daniel uh, is very much active today as he was in Daniel chapter 2, verse 22, where it says, God reveals profound and hidden things. He knows what's in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. In uh, uh, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2, verse 7, Paul told Timothy, he says, Consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. That's not some things. He will give you understanding. God, the subject, will give you understanding in everything. So how does God give understanding to people with a history uh, like you have? And so for those who are counselors, therapists, and pastors, when you're working in this domain, you have to understand biblical anthropology, what God says about men, and how this operates, and how this functions. And so the Holy Spirit, in union with the Neshama, the human spirit, there is a, a koinonia there that enables you to know whatever you need to know to come out of this captivity and become whole, complete, and lacking nothing. Uh, of course, like it, uh, it says in James chapter 1 and verse 4. So uh, you can read more about that uh, from the website. I gave you the reference. And so uh, as we begin our interview time, I would like to begin with Dan as a, a person I've known since 1979. I love and admire. He's never heard that before. He's probably shocked. But, uh, <laughs> You know, really, I mean, the journey that we've been on together is absolutely, it could be a book in and of itself. And um, it wasn't until 2002 that we got past the Mengele barrier and into the domain of the human spirit in Neshama. From that time on, it was merely clearing off some of the constructs around Dan's human spirit so he could begin to emerge and be here as the, God, as the person God created and redeemed him to be. It has been a very long journey. Um, and so it's my pleasure to begin this uh, interview with Dan to kind of set the, the, the tone as we move around and, and allow the others uh, to, to speak. And so as in our outline here, if you'll notice, um, I, I have, uh, after the uh, introduction, um, that each person uh, summarize the significance of your ancestral background and bloodline as it relates to the bringing in of the Antichrist and the false prophet. So, that's the point of our outline. So, Dan, please uh, uh, begin as the Lord directs you. Well, I, I, uh, I see this primarily on my part as a background, uh, a background into what's happened. Obviously, I'm not an Ethiopian mother. I have not even seen Ethiopian from my experience, but I fully understand the testimony of women here, and I see a very significant aspect of my life involved in this. Uh, I, I mentioned earlier my name. European names, uh, Daniel Michael George Alexander Collins, uh, and that, um, as, as Doug said, really came to light fully once I got past it. In, in working in the Roman Association and in recovering uh, significant memories and working back through uh, that which was just dissociated off in, in, in a, a, a pocket of memories, I think it to an extensive history with Joseph Mengele. And, uh, and I have said in the past that in my life, he's, he's about the closest thing to a father that I knew, how bizarre that may sound. Uh, but working back to that, I had a significant life. You know, and at a certain point, it, things did open up and I dropped back past that to uh, who my biological father is. And, and, uh, he, uh, he was the top of King George VI, uh, the, the House of Windsor. The, uh, the significance of that has to do with, uh, as I mentioned, the culmination of 13 bloodlines. I believe there are primary uh, bloodlines uh, in the earth, uh, centered in Europe, and primarily the Germanic bloodlines uh, coming uh, right down. And as we, we work through this, and I think we see a very clear connection really from Satan himself down uh, through uh, Cain, Nimrod, uh, and all the way down. And, uh, um, with these royal bloodlines comes a culmination of wickedness and evil passed down from generation to generation. Uh, we believe that God has shown us that there are many of these 
bloodlines have never had a Christian. From father to son, father to son, father to son. Uh, the iniquity, each individual fully responsible for their own actions, carrying not only their own actions, but the uh, consequences of the actions of their father so that it culminates and builds and builds and builds. And so when you have generation after generation of these who represent the kings of the earth from uh, Psalm 2, coming down to a point in history where, where the adversary wants to bring to a point the culmination of all these bloodlines, which represent the royalty of the kings of the earth. Mm -hmm. And in this culmination, uh, if we can be, bring it to a point in an individual, and then bring that into the church because that individual has become a Christian and he's carried generations of satanic uh, hatred, bitterness, wrath, and sin and iniquity right into the church. Uh, and even though Jesus Christ died for those sins, if that is continued on and it's not then seen and dealt with, it represents uh, it, it, a place where the church as the bride is not being brought to a place of maturity or without spot. Mm -hmm. And as I have uh, regained my history, my past, and as just the very, uh, the knowledge of God has been given to me through what we said through the Mishabah, we've seen the history come um, generationally where it comes down and it comes to a point um, in my life. I, I do believe the Lord has made it clear to me that, uh, that my conception had to do uh, with the 13 uh, kings who represented that uh, European Germanic bloodline, all in a, in, a, in a form of gross wickedness, culminating in that which is my conception, uh, primarily through, uh, uh, through my father, who was, who was uh, uh, crowned King George VI. Uh, and in that, if I represent the firstborn son of King George VI, then I would carry the heritage of what that represents and means. And if that has all been brought together, the 13 lines brought together into what, then should we say the authority, the, the supernatural authority of that uh, bloodline resides in a person. And as we have talked about, and, and has, has come clearly into view through the, the work, the prayer ministry, this all came to him. Seventy-six. When, in fact, I was in Europe, and when I was crowned King George the Seventh. There was a new Swanstein Castle. In the January night, new Swanstein Castle. There was a three weeks of uh, activity <coughs> ceremonies where, uh, as Michael Collins, as the name I was crowned Michael Collins, I was on the dignity, and it had all the common circumstance of any uh, royal coronation. The only thing it didn't have was the public. Uh, Acknowledgement or the publicity worldwide because it was not meant to be. This is the end ground. Uh, and in that, even the Pope was there, attended to uh, oversaw the services. Uh, I had the, um, the coronation, and then uh, uh, back, I was back to England in uh, June and July and at Windsor Castle for the, uh, the uh, uh, appointing to the Order of the Garter. All that which represents the pomp and circumstance in an inner level of this position of King George II. And, and if all this from Satan having infected uh, the bloodlines coming down and uh, being culminating in a person so that it can be taken, and by 1976 we have Nephilim prepared. We have a history uh, reported from a number of individuals that the, that these Nephilim creatures have moved by the mid seventies into positions where they take authority away from the kings of the earth and begin to function in authority themselves. So, nineteen seventy six is a culmination of that, which represents the authority of the kings of that earth, bringing it to a point, uh, generational culmination in an individual who is a Christian, and then the act of transfer over to these Nephilim, uh, these hybrid Nephilims. So yeah, I was just going to say that uh, the report we have that Constantina gave birth to, to the first generation of hybrids, was it 62? So 76, that makes about 13 years later, and they, the number 13 would be the time when that first hybrid would be in the place to be the point of transfer 
uh, during this ceremony, which is very significant that that first generation hybrid would be approximately age 13 when this event took place that you're talking about. That. So what, what we have is um, the iniquity of the men on the earth coming to a culminating point in the church, so there's a defilement there that's hidden through dissociation. And then through the contact I've had with these gals, where there is the sharing of essence and trauma bonding and in uh, uh, symbiotic unions, the essence of that which represented the sins of, of my forefathers, uh, I think culminating in, uh, in a hatred of the Christian heart. Mm -hmm. Shit, it is, it is uh, that, that hatred of the Christian heart that the adversary has uh, infects the very Christian life, the very life that I have, all the way up to and around the spirit. And then in these symbiotic unions and trauma bonding uh, with gals, it's like the giving of myself, sharing that very spirit and infecting even uh, the gals that I've got brought into these uh, traumatic events with. And then as we've heard the testimony, they turn and in the context of their life are brought into union with these fallen angels and produce a method. So the, the, the iniquity of Satan coming down through man, crossing over into the church and through the women being anchored in these Nephilim who are taking them. Wow, that's tremendous, Dan. Thank you. Uh, I was just thinking that we're going to be uh, beginning with uh, Susanna now. And of course there was a, a, a whole history of being bonded with Dan and and uh, through this marriage that occurred there at New Swanstein. Um, and, you know, in the beginning when I was working with Susanna, I thought she just had ego states. I mean, I, you know, I, I just worked with everyone who obviously was manifesting uh, parts like Sybil and that kind of thing. Uh, but Susanna, was, you didn't see that. And so I just kind of dismissed that she was probably even the candidate for Nephilim Mother. So, I, I mean, I was really obtuse. I mean, I had real issues. They all know that. I still do, but if I'm abiding in Christ, I'm just fine. It's just when I get out, it's really a serious problem. So, uh, anyway, the, uh, that's a little side note to know that we're all very, very human and that we all need the Lord now more than, than ever before. But in this uh, particular uh, incident with uh, Susanna, I, I just missed it. And it wasn't even until this year that, that we recognized that she, I mean, Susanna gave birth to these, these hybrids as another person, but there was a very hidden sequestered part of her identity that only gave birth to that which is a representation of the false prophet. And it was completely hidden. It wasn't even revealed to this year. And so, um, I don't know if I'm getting ahead of myself, but uh, you can go ahead and respond. You know, Dan was keeping us on track and I'm just thinking, you know, just uh, kind of up to date with you, Susanna. So go ahead and respond to A, the best way you know how, and we've got a lot to cover today, but we'll trust the Lord to keep us on track. Well, Dan said that he had never had direct contact with the meth one. Well, I was the contact link with the meth one. You were, you were the proxy link. I was the proxy yeah. link for Dan, and there was a reason Dan and I were groomed together. His affections were drawn out, particularly around me, although other women were involved. I saw him as my kind of like a big big brother. He was at my birth. I was given to him at infancy by my mother who was sacrificed and he took ownership of me. So in, on my side, I was kind of groomed to look to him as a savior. And on his side, I was being groomed and reciprocated kind of like a female counterpart to him and uh, with the 13 lines and everything. But I was kind of what came into Dan as he um, first embraced that spirit of Alexander, kind of came out through me and culminated ultimately in this birth of this son, Alexander Nimrod Apollyon. Who represents uh, a modern day false prophet. So right there you see the transfer of that which he first embraced through me, culminating in the birth of this son. And there's been the birth of other sons. Um, You're talking about hybrids. In hybrids. Um, it wasn't until four years ago when we were still located in Tulsa before we had moved into group fellowship here more. Uh, not, well, we're not all together, but we are broken up into, into, into homes. And I've moved into fellowship with two other women. And especially living with Sally, who's gone out ahead of me, she's seen the bondage, tremendous bondage that I have been in. 
Mm. I owe a lot to her who's failed for me. And But it's only been in the last four and a half years that I've been able to start uncovering even the, the Nephilim mother. I remember once going to Doug and saying, can I just be a Nephilim mother today? Because somebody inside thinks they are. And, and I never did manifest that. And then finally one day, it was only when Diane came into our midst and we began to see this project is much bigger than isolated mothers here and there. Mm -hmm that when you called and said, what about you, Susan? I just burst into tears and my history started opening up. And I know that um, I have birthed at least 17, six original hybrids and then- um, Yeah, like first generation. First generational hybrids by the prop, two sets of twins uh, fathered by the prophet, the beast and antichrist. And off of those uh, secondary, second generation hybrids and some human as well that have been used mm -hmm. but uh, culminating then in the birth of this last son when i was 48 and uh, culminating in who was fathered by satan himself mm -hmm. and so i want people to hear that father by satan himself that means that satan is a fallen cherub and uh, he has carried out this act this generation then he already knows his destiny because it's already, it's already happened in Genesis 6. So it's the end game. His hand is forced and it's God that is forcing his hand. And I was, uh, the first three months of my life, I was held under the Temple Mount, uh, being bonded only with spirits. This is preliminary to being a mother because that's the way it's engineered that your earliest bonds are with spirits only, both light and dark so that you're kept in that tension of the false light and the terror and um, being groomed and set up to bond with these creatures. And the hardest part of my journey has been right now breaking off from the bonds that I've had with this last son. Mm -hmm. The one that was the most hidden. Because it's like all my mother bonds, all the incest bonds, everything had been brought forward right into that son. And it's been excruciating to break those bonds off and to see them and the intensity. And but as I, as in doing that, um, the Lord is able to come in and, and replace those bonds with Himself. So. Thank you. Well, Sally is uh, someone we've known since the early '80s, and uh, things begin to really break uh, in her life. She came to us uh, with counseling issues in the mid '80s. We didn't know anything about the DID, or back then it was called uh, multiple personality disorder. And so we did uh, work on occult bondages that were manifesting in Sally's life through the 80s, but then things weren't resolving. I felt stuck, and I was talking to Dr. C. Fred Dixon, Dr. Mark Bubeck, and they said, I, we're taking you as far as we can go. So I happened to, I waited, uh, some, I heard in 1990 about multiple personality disorder. And you know what I said, where is that in the Bible? You know, like, you know, where do you find dentists and engineers in the Bible? It could have been the same question. But anyway, um, I, I heard about Jim Friesen's book that was going to be released in June of 1991. Picked up a copy. He's a preacher's kid, a delightful guy. It's called Uncovering the Mystery of MPD. And I was one of our sessions working with Sally. And I started read. I said, you know, this kind of sounds like maybe what ritual abuse. So I'm going to read some sections from Jim Friesen's book to Sally. And, uh, so I read some and... Uh, it, these parts were being described by Jim Friesen in, the, in his counseling session. And the next thing I know, here's Sally that we've known for 10 years. She's kind of drawn up on the couch with her knees uh, in her chest and she's sucking her thumb and kind of rocking. And I saw somebody that was very young. And uh, first thing I did, I said, well, do I know you? And what's your name? My name is Sarah. And that opened the door. And I said, why haven't you been here before? And basically he says, because we didn't think you would believe us. But now, you know, basically I was reading this book. Now they, parts can come out and let me know that they're there too. Okay. So that opened the door and, uh, to our journey with MPD, SRA, uh, the, 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 the dissociative part in 1991. And during the, uh, those 90s, it was, I mean, thousands of hours with Sally. Um, and it was kind of a cutting uh, edge. It was the groundbreaking, at least on a mother side. We heard about the, the hybridization back in the uh, 1980s. But it's been a very long journey, 
and Sally has gone on to get her master's and uh, she's a great help here in the work and with others. She works, uh, she, I, if I'm gone, uh, she can step right in and, and do excellent work. And so uh, I'm real proud of what God has done uh, in Sally's life and I consider it an honor for her to be able to be here and especially thank the Lord for where he's brought her so that uh, my burden is a whole lot lighter now that we have someone who can pick up and carry on and do work and I don't even have to be present. So uh, go ahead, Sally, you can talk about uh, this first part and what, uh, what this has to do with you in terms of uh, your history. Well, um, you introduced and said that in the 80s, I always knew something was desperately wrong with me and just crying out to the Lord for uh, just to bring light on what's going on. And uh, so in the 80s, things began to open up and almost immediately began to see the, uh, the position of the unholy trinity that was within me of, the, of Satan, the, the beast, Antichrist, the prophet. And that was um, placed deep within my very core. Um, and then out from that, things began to focus more on a position of being mother and wife of the false prophet. And so um, that was very early on in the 80s, I'm sorry, in the 90s when things began to uh, open up. Um, and also during that time, it was kind of interesting because many of the things that we're dealing with now were things that had come out in the early 90s. And because there wasn't a witness of other people bringing in their testimony, it was thought that it was kind of an isolated thing uh, or just um, separated out for a few. But at that time, I uh, began to talk about the Nephilim Project and what Satan's purpose was, was to destroy man and to bring in his new man. We were grounded in the word for many years in uh, God's eternal purpose, and that is that we were created in God's image and to bring forth, uh, God wanted many sons and to be able to uh, represent a, a godly link. Well, Satan has his plans and he has reproduced that through the bloodline. And uh, my background being a Jewish background, but also have the 13 bloodlines as well um, that brought in a uh, gave birth to an entity in, at age 12 that um, was representative of the false prophet at that time um, and I was a uh, in one essence I was a uh, I don't know what you call it a counterpart because I think Susan said she was a counterpart but to Dan in 1976 when um, he was coronated the last king, King George the Seventh, King George the Seventh of this earth, and at that particular during those three weeks, then there was a ceremony. I was in Jerusalem, and there was enough power and sacrifices in Jerusalem that occurred as, as well. What was going on in Neuschwanstein that catapulted us both up into the air uh, because. Uh, just a little background, there's, there's no dimensions, or there's, a, um, you can explain the physics, but Satan is above the three-dimensional, the four-dimensional. And so we were catapulted, and there was a transfer then of power, of a culmination of all the bloodlines, of all the iniquity, of all the kings, and all the authority then through Dan into me, and then for me, down to my son and the representative of the Antichrist at that time that was being uh, coronated in Jerusalem or having their throne being established with their, the heads of the Nephilim for each bloodline as well. So um, that was the significance of my role was I believe now to bring about that transfer from the human agent to the uh, satanic, from to the to the methylene, uh, to help bring in the antichrist and the false prophet, to help do away from this hu the humanness, so that there could be a leap from one man, from one 
mankind to another, the Homo Neaticus. And so it was very dedicated um, for that purpose from age, from the birth of the son to age 13 to 25, uh, because I thought God had abandoned me to this purpose. Um, and then at that point at 25, came back to my senses and then began to want to be dedicated for Jesus Christ and for his purpose in seeing that he alone is king. And so at that point then had um, dedicated myself to undoing this, exposing his realm through God's ways and through God's means and uh, learning what his way is, but not by might, but through his spirit, through his life and through divine love. Mm. And I, I would just say that each one of these uh, histories and stories, there's so much more, there's so much uh, uh, involved. So we're just skimming the surface. And uh, we look forward to our being in South Africa where we can spend more personal time with those that need to have more details. So this is more, is still all introduction. But uh, we have Jennifer Diane next. And um, just, uh, I, I heard about her plight here about three and a half years ago to some close friends that she was cutting. She attempted suicide. Would you come and help? And I thought, well, she's raised in a Christian family, so what's going on here? Come to find out she was abused in a Christian church, a mainline denomination, evangelical denomination, has approximately 400 in Canada, will not name it. But the person who was the head of that denomination was a primary abuser in the church that she grew up in. Um, so I met her about three and a half years ago, and um, thought, well, she's abusing the church. Uh, this is going to be serious, obviously, if she's cutting their suicide. But it's not going to be like anything that I've already worked with with these bloodline people. So I just had that in my mind. This should not take too long because she's young and there's a lot going for her. So I continued to do the work, and um, uh, I got to one point, and I said, who is this person in the church answer to? Who is his authority? Well, she had strong resistance. She would not answer me. I won't believe it. It can't be true. I said, no, you got to report. If we're going to make progress, you report, because the denial was really huge. And um, lo and behold, the one who was financing the project was, and I, and I love going public on this one, Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. I hope this rocks the whole world. Nobody's going to edit this. I'm willing to pay the consequences, because I already have. So when I, I heard that name, I just got up, got on the phone. I said, this is a whole lot bigger than just what took place in a, you know, a Christian church. I mean, this, this is international. There's something going on here. Why uh, did they select someone who is not you know, from a royal bloodline? This is all new to me. I mean, this is a new category. And so we've been on a, a three and a half year journey uh, where Virginia is now. There's been significant integration. Um, but what we've gone through to get there, there's been just as massive of opposition as anything I met with in you in the beginning. In fact, the two of you together seem to be the closest in terms of the level of resistance and the breaking down of anyone. I mean, you, 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 it's like you're almost twinned in the way you're programmed. And so on the, on the prophet side, she's programmed on the Antichrist side. So anyway, that's the brief introduction. Um, it's a real delight to have Jenny with us. I just or, we love her family, and, uh, and she's uh, moved here. She got a green card, so it's really great to have her here with us. And so Jenny, you pick up and you respond any way that the Lord directs you, okay? I say Jenny, I call her Jenny because that was kind of her inner self helper. I know that she's Jennifer Diane. <laughs> I know, I was going to clarify that one too. Everyone's <laughs> calling me by a different name. <laughs> But anyway, um, no, I remember when I met Doug, I, like you said, I had been cutting and I was overdosing and similar to what Sally said, it's just, I knew something was desperately wrong. And I could look at others and other Christians and I had gone to, at one point, a Bible school and I would just tell the Lord, Lord. I see this life in other people, but I don't know it. I don't have life. And well, it got to a point where I just basically, I gave up and I said, Lord, I, I want you to have all of me, but I don't know how to give it. And so I just gave up and things went downhill from there. I 
like I already said, I was cutting, overdosing. And then I met Doug through some people that I know. And I didn't know anything about DID. I didn't know anything about SRA. All I know is I'm talking to this guy over there who goes, well, I guess we're just done for today. And the next thing, I feel like I'm five years old. And Doug's going, it's a switch. And I'm going, what's a switch? <laughs> <laughs> it was crazy. It was but new to you, then. It was. I had never heard of it. And, and I thought it would be done in two weeks. <laughs> and I'm still here. <laughs> Doug thought it would be done in two weeks. <laughs> but, but no, since then, it's just been, well, just excavating the depths of what I have really been involved in and what I've been dedicated to by others, but then me, myself, have been fully invested in, which is bringing about essentially Antichrist, and that it's like God has his purpose to be head of his church and then have the church as his body, and it's the head expressing itself through the church, and kind of like, I guess, a new man. Well, then Satan has mirrored that with him as head, and to bring in his one new man and his, which is Antichrist. And he has woven myself together, and then each of us, it's like we've been woven together to create a very imitation of what God intended for the body of Christ, but a satanic representation. And it's, and that's what. I've been brought into, that's what I've been a part of, and that's what I have been invested in. Can I just make a comment? Yes. Uh, in, in your bloodline, mm -hmm. because you have a, a great grandfather who had already dedicated, made the transaction with uh, some of the kings of the earth to bring in this new bloodline. So you already dedicated mm -hmm. prior to conception. So there was an agenda in place so that when you were born, right in the hospital, they got right to you. They told your mother that you go, oh, you're sick, and they, they took her away. She wasn't sick, and they got her for two weeks in the hospital, yeah. incubator, and they did this most horrific formatting of this whole generational agenda and just downloaded it in there. Hybrids were present. Satan was manifesting in that two weeks, and, and he was the one who was engineering and structuring your DID system. So this is the magnitude of it. As one who is to be a representative bringing this new bloodline, the fulfillment of Genesis 6 2, whomever they chose, uh, you, you happen to be selected because you're Christian, and so you fit the criteria to open for Satan to now, in this generation, to have a Genesis 6 2 uh, reach out to the whole human race. So I, I wanted to add that because it's, it's, people are not going to get the magnitude of it without that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, because, and that's what. It's like, so it's like in the beginning it was dedicated and there was all this structuring and things that they did, but then it's, there's a degree where I was brought into it as well. You had to be aligned with it. I had to be aligned with it. And to come out of that, it, it took the intervention of the Lord to get me out. Big time. But I guess to answer the question, <laughs> about the ancestral background in my bloodline. I, I kind of said it earlier. Um, my bloodline, it was almost as if it took the iniquity of what had been done in every other bloodline, and it was taking all of history, and then it, it was just funneled into me. And it's, that's, again, it's part of the interconnecting, the interweaving. Mm -hmm. But it's this funneling of iniquity, this convergence, to produce a new bloodline containing all that has happened from it, from like the fall of Satan to well now to Antichrist to Antichrist mm -hmm. and so that's what I've been involved in and really on my side I was primarily designed to bring forth a representation of Antichrist that was my role that was my function that's what I was aligned with was to bear to conceive and give birth to a representation of an antichrist. And who do you understand the father of your hybrid son to be? Satan. So, people got to grapple with that. Yeah. If Satan is a fallen angel and the Benihai, if he's a member of the Benihai Elohim, 
of Genesis 6, only he wasn't involved there or he'd have been put into Tartarus. Mm -hmm. He wasn't. So the fact that he's involved now means this is end game. But you know, the very fact that is Satan, it's, it, it is a very trespass of Satan onto the Lord's territory. Yeah, as and a Christian. It, as a Christian. And I guess like for counselors who watch, watch this or whatever, it, it is, it's extremely difficult to get to because it is a, I have been brought into oneness with Satan himself and his agenda. I have been. But I guess that's why I just say that's took the intervention of the Lord to, he's bringing me out yeah. and all that I've been aligned with and all that I've been involved in. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And I think that we can do uh, probably uh, at least one more uh, before we take our break. Um, uh, Julie, um, I met Julie um, in the mid 80s. Uh, she moved from, I guess it was Iowa. She went, Omaha. Omaha. It was in Omaha, okay. I, I don't know where I came up with Iowa. But I, mean, I was raised in Iowa. Okay, that, maybe that's what I was thinking. So, um, began the, the counseling time with uh, Julie um, years ago. And uh, Julie is very much different than everyone else. I mean, she doesn't have the kind of ways in which things present. If you were to look at Julie in terms of uh, fragmentation, it was kind of like Dan. You, Dan didn't really present parts. There's just so much polyfragmentation. You just basically have one person sitting in front of you, which is true of all of you, but it's, it's, it's like so much is covert. So much of what goes on in Julie, it is straight face, and anything switching, anything that you're commonly aware of, it's all inside. You don't see a thing. And I think Julie was structured in a way that, that she was never supposed to know. Uh, you know so um, she did mention your background, and, uh, and I think that where you are now, I know that there's more awareness that you need to come to in terms of uh, new birth identity and that, but in, in anything you would like to personalize in view of where we are on this, uh, this outline in terms of your history, Julie. Um, I think that it was, with the world bloodlines, it's like a, a power base to, um, and there's been lots of layers. It's like an onion that you peel off the layers. Uh, for a while we thought that <coughs> I held a Diana position Goddess Diana. And, and it was there. And it was there. And we and then we came to understand that it was actually Semiramis on the back side of that, that they were back to back like a Janus twins. And uh, but now I'm coming to understand that um, coming to understand that it's actually power base uh, for uh, a template and a power base for the beast. Position. So, uh, when you say beast, what are you referring to? Apollyon beast. It's the it's the the black trinity is the antichrist, the false prophet, and the beast. So okay. it's like halfway through the tribulation, antichrist will switch from being the good guy to the bad guy. Okay. And well, I mean, in terms of biblical nomenclature, we we talk, the beast in Revelation 16. It says the beast, the fault, the beast, the false prophet, and the dragon. So they're really all three beasts, mm -hmm. but yeah. it's kind of confusing. So, so when you usually yeah. say beast in that passage is the Antichrist, and the dragon is the dragon, the false prophet is the false prophet. So do you, you see your connection primarily more with the dragon himself as Apollyon, or uh, Antichrist as the beast and the false prophet? How do you, how do you see your... You see? Okay, right. The destroyer. Okay, that'd be Apollyon then. Okay, go ahead, continue right. on. Thank you. So, um, anyway, just with the... The power base of iniquity in the, gener the royal bloodlines, um, bringing that about, and and I'm still coming to unpack all of that. I'm still coming into uh, what it all actually means. But I was raised, you know, I was born in Jerusalem, brought over here um, to the United States when I was two. How much to go into but the but the point of that is that you were put into a surrogate family just like these others so that your real bloodline family and your connection with these projects would be concealed because your surrogate family they abused you so the memories and defenses would first be there 
You get past that and you get into your bundle. And they were also my cousins, so they were, I was incested okay. as well. They don't miss an opportunity yeah. to, uh, incest, to uh, do that. <clears throat> so, Well, that's good. I think uh, uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to um, to move to Connie and her uh, connection with what we've been looking at, and the uh, each person summarizing the significance of their ancestral background or bloodline as it relates to the bringing of Antichrist and the false prophet. Um, when I first met Connie in 1997, uh, went up to Eureka. Montana, and uh, she was so terrified to see me, it took almost a half hour, I think, before you could just peek your head out from the bedroom and come down the stairs, just completely terrified. Um, Connie was switching so rapidly that with every blink of her eyes, there was a switch going on. Uh, it was intense and massive polyfragmentation. Um, so it it's, it's pegs the meter, and the, the DES, that is the Dissociative Experience Scale, uh, it would be maxed out, and I think with everyone here. Um, so that began our journey. I was invited uh, to uh, go work with Connie, through a pastor there in Eureka, Montana, and uh, that started the journey of her uh, working with her, her coming to Tulsa, going back and forth, where these the people are here with me now, uh, they stayed in one place, and her going back and forth involved continual accessing and uh, real challenges that are unique uh, to her. So uh, Connie is truly an overcomer. I mean, there's no question about it. It's the Lord who has been overcoming in her. Um, uh, she, uh, her biological father is that which represents the confluence of bringing in the new bloodline. Her mother is Queen Elizabeth. I mean, anybody that looks at her, including Elizabeth, can see the physiognomy. It's no mystery. Uh, it's not something she's proud of. Uh, whether Queen Elizabeth knows this or not, I don't know. But uh, um, it's, she's a part of that Windsor um, uh, connection. Um, the important thing is, her, is who she is as a Christian. And she was targeted. She's a part of this uh, confluence from the old bloodlines into the new bloodlines. Um, Connie's been with us here in Syracuse for almost what, five or six years, and so it's been uh, a long and arduous journey to, to go through all the dissociative layers, and uh, she's got tears, and that's, that's authentic. That means, you know, if you're coming out of a spiritual holocaust, you're going to, you're going to be bearing the, uh, the brand marks. G Paul said in Galatians 6, I bear in my body the brand marks of Jesus Christ. Those tears are brand marks. That's... That means this isn't some hype. Um, as one person said, uh, I would never trust uh, the testimony of, 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 of uh, those who are MPDS or DID. Uh, well, I do, because I know, that I know my God and, they, and I know their God. And whatever it takes to come out of, of this type of captivity, there's a huge cost. And uh, Connie, you have demonstrated that you're willing to pay that cost. So I know that this is always not easy for you. And uh, so you can be authentic. You don't have to apologize for tears uh, because this is a representation of your history that is, uh, has been horrific. Um, and you're, as we get to the end, we're going to be able to talk about um, you know, uh, what this means in terms of your Christian experience. But if you could just address... Um, like I said, what, this ancestral background, your bloodline, I mean, why you? Why do you think that you were selected for your conceived, before you are born, to be, become grand dame, uh, uh, mother of these, all these Nephilim mothers, to become, uh, to our knowledge at this time, uh, the, the, the first mother of a hybrid by Satan? Um, why you? Why, why do you think you were chosen? What does this represent in terms of you as a person? Okay, well, first of all, thanks for your introduction. Um, Lori said, speak up. <laughs> okay. Um, well, okay, there, my mother is in the O'Collins bloodline. She's King George's daughter. And, at, and they're like the oldest Druidic bloodline in history that's still <coughs> in existence. 
and, and actually goes all the way back to Nimrod. Mm -hmm. And so uh, at 13, a girl of, of coming from that bloodline, so my mother at 13, uh, normally in, um, well, I mean, not just normal, this is protocol at 13, the father impregnates his daughter and produces a child. So this was the rite of passage that King George would have with Queen Elizabeth, with my mother. And so, but because they were working to bring about a new bloodline, a non-royal bloodline, just anybody bringing about like the Genesis 6 project, all the stuff that goes in with that, they're, they're setting up a new new template and I'm the template for that new bloodline. Because you so, connect the old bloodline with the new bloodline. Is yes. The convergence. Yes. And so under normal circumstances it would have been King George with his daughter. But because they, uh, my real parentage, he's also linked into the dreaded blood, bloodline in a sense, you know, not in a royal. He's not a royal family, my father. But they gave him the right to step into the role that King George would have to create the, the new bloodline, the whole Genesis 6 project. So, in a sense, I'm the product of the, well, I'm not a sense, I'm a product of uh, Elizabeth and then this new person that they brought in, which I won't mention his name right now for uh, purposes. I'm not trying to protect him, he's not even really. But there's family members that, you know, we're, we're looking to, there's a, a proper time and place to unveil some certain things. So in a sense, you would have to say what George would have had with the Elizabeth. I stepped in and took that place instead. And so I'm linked in for, through my mother. And so the template... Um, Could you define what you mean by template? As a template, I was... The Genesis 6 project, the whole Nephilim mother, but not with like just principalities and powers uh, coming together with uh, women. It would have been with Satan himself. Wow. And so, uh, and I laid down the template like a, as a mother of the mothers, you know, and so it's not a role that I'm proud of. What goes with that, the ugliness, the terrible things, you know, and what's done with the babies and stuff like that. It's very, so, um, I mean, in a nutshell, I guess that's what I would say, you know, and, and outwardly I was placed with a certain family in the U.S. when I was three, and so outwardly I didn't know about any of this. I would go to school, but I was always sick. I had major ab reactions, like obsessive compulsive stuff, bowels so many times, touching my toes so many times. You know, I knew all that stuff outwardly and was in counseling for years. Uh, after I was an adult, not knowing, they just thought it was depression. But when I went to Minard Meyer Clinic, they said I had a personality disorder. And I didn't know what that meant, so I went home, and five months later, I almost took my life. I just barely got saved, you know, as far as my physical body. That's before and, you met me. And that's before I met you. That was, you know, probably a year and a half before I met you yet. So, I mean, it's it's been, you know, why me? I, the product of the parents, you know, but I'm a part of what was set in place in their thought, in their mind, to bring in the whole new bloodline, the whole new project. And, uh, and, and that does have to do with the Nephilim mothers. It has to do with Satan producing children with these mothers, uh, with these women, I should say, you know, so. Yeah. Now, and you mentioned in, in the work that we've done, um, that you're the firstborn son that you had in terms of direct off, offspring of Satan himself was born in 62, 63. And it took a while to get there because we, we had other, you had other hybrids. I mean, we thought it was, it was uh, uh, Phil, Phil Michael, Alex, George, and all these different, uh, they kind of carry some of the titular heads of these bloodlines in, the, in, the, in these new kings who are hybrids. But it wasn't until we were going to a Disdar conference a couple of years ago that we broke in past all these other mother and wife positions that you had with reference to these sons. And it was pretty elation. You dropped into that which is the most hidden, that you gave birth to a firstborn antichrist son. 
named Nimrod. That was no small thing. So why, why do you think that the, this firstborn hybrid was named Nimrod? Because we know that there's a, the Alexander part of the name and all that. Why, why do you think Nimrod? Because they're linking back into <coughs> history, back into generations, like with the Tower, tower of Babel. Um, okay. <laughs> that, means <laughs> that means increase the volume. Of <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, so we're linking back to the Tower of Babel. Yes, the Tower of Babel and the first incursion of, of Nephilim back in Bible times. It's linking back and do that, pulling it forward. It's like some people would say, well, it's just him resurrected, but it's not. This is present day. This is not some resurrected Nimrod. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> something else I was going to say, but I forgot. <laughs> um, well, it's just being, the thing about being in a place called Rondon, the great mother of all the other succeeding mothers, is that you would be brought in, like these other women's birth that are going to be Nephilim brothers, you'd be brought in, Satan would, of course, manifest, he already has this structure in you, and then that template, there could be a, an energizing and a transferring, like a blueprint, an imprint, and so that structured system would, would be transferred to other mothers that would give them the capacity to conceive and give birth to hybrids. And that, that's, that means that something was done to you to create uh, an embellishment to your DNA so that Satan could impart his seed to create his offspring. Yes, so at the base, I only saw myself as a blueprint. And originally that blueprint was blank. Neshma. Mm -hmm. It's blank. It's this place where you can connect with God. And it's like Satan says, I will capture that for myself. And he wraps himself around it and he begins to stamp his blueprint on there. I mean, his imprint on the blueprint which was the whole project thing. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, I couldn't see myself as existing, I was just a blueprint. Mm -hmm. I laid a foundation down for others. And it was linked in, not with just Antichrist, but it actually represents the three positions. And the Lord's yeah. only It's the dragon, the Antichrist, the false prophet, the Lord's mm -hmm. black trinity. Mm -hmm. that, that is the three positions yeah. that were put in place, and then mm -hmm. everything is filled off of that. And kind of, same way with Diane, even though she had that representation of the Antichrist, mm -hmm. it really, cap, you know, it, it captures all of it, you know, oh, so yeah. it's mm -hmm. out, out that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that there's there's so much more. I know that those will be watching this in the future, there'll be lots of questions. So, and there's so much more that, uh, that you could share. Uh, go ahead. I know what I wanted to say. Um, because I think this might be important for some people that will be listening to this, especially counselors. It's like, I didn't just go into counseling and then I go from here down to this. Yeah. Um, it was structure that I had like different fathers. So my first layer of working was with the Bill Shaw father. That's your surrogate father. And that was very, that's my surrogate father. Very, very substantial. When we get there, we <laughs> drop down into where uh, Philip, I call him Mr. P. That's uh, Prince Philip. Yeah, Prince Philip is my father. And for that whole structure that they designed inside for all practical purposes, he was Constance. He was father to Constance. And that's the only father I as Constance knew. Mm -hmm. Get behind Constance, there's Constantina. We get to George. And, and really, when I said how King George, George King George stepped out of the place and let this other man step in to take the role that he should have filled. Then at my birth, I was immediately bonded with Satan. But when I bonded with an outside person, it was King George. This other man was not the first person I bonded with outwardly. They intentionally brought King George in. You're, sure, you're talking about your biological father. My biological father. Yeah, they wanted me to... Uh, bond with this other man first. So for me as Constantina, that Constantina, he is my father. He, for all practical purposes, he's all I know as my father. So it's really only since Christmas time that I've known about this biological father. So it's still pretty tender for me. I don't think that that's fully unfolded for me yet. It's probably the most difficult work I've done oh, yeah. to the degree that I tell God 
many times a week, I just would never have thought this far into the journey it could be mm -hmm. this intense, this horrific. But it's because I'm just getting the very base now, final roots, and it's not done. I'm still kind of in that. Yeah, and I would just say that since you got into the, the covering this biological, the true biological father, because it's the crossover into the Genesis 6 yes. 2, whomever they chose. Before it was bloodline, now it's the daughters of Adam, Adam just like it was in the days of Noah. But they didn't want me to know that. Yeah, that's the point. They wanted me to fully own who I was as royalty, yeah. as the bloodline. <clears throat> I was never, ever supposed to know. I mean, Je Jennifer Diane is the first man I've covered it. Yeah. I knew I had links and ties in there. But what she said, I know. And I mean, I, there was, I collapsed on the floor I because that. it was like there was that. It's and an uncovered. Yeah, and so I was never supposed to know that. I was only supposed to know about all these different bloodlines because I was linked into that with the Ocala's, the 13th. But I was only supposed to know about that. I was not supposed to know about all no. this other stuff going on behind the scenes. No. So. And I think, too, when George passed off the scene in 52, because uh, he's kind of the primary titular head and handler for who you are to shield your primary father. I mean, he's King Jordan. He's no small person. So all the abuse around that and the horrific things that happened with him, he died. He's actually sacrificed. Right. You know that. In, in that and cult. I was at his death. And and who who did he transfer the responsibility to to be your primary uh, handler when jo George goes off the scene? Who's your primary handler? Mr. P. Yeah, Prince Philip. And we've had so much encounter all through this journey. Uh, he has been very aggressively. Um, uh, pursuing many of you, he, uh, he's been the primary uh, uh, deal, one I've dealt with in terms of the conflict behind the scenes. I've been threatened through a surrogate uh, website in Saudi Arabia, I think it was, that came down to, from him. Uh, but uh, in, his, um, in his role in your life, I remember uh, when we did the Nephilim Mother interviews, I think it was one, I think the, when, the first interview we did, you oh, given him testimony, and you were decompensating. I mean, you were hard, having a hard time staying present because you kept saying, I'm going to be in trouble now. I'm going to be in trouble now. You start to unclose, disclose this Genesis project as, as, as you related to it, and I, you, you decompensated. I, you know, I'm going to get in trouble. That night, I believe it was that night, you got a phone call, 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, and on the caller ID, it has my name. And you pick up the phone and just go ahead and give us that piece because I think that's pretty... Well, it's just threats and you know what's going to happen. Or who's on the phone? Mr. P. And? I don't remember. I think it was your so-called uh, uh, your uh, mother, but it was your uh, it was your surrogate mother, wasn't it? Oh, well, see, but he's always the primary. I mean, she's just... She's just just of, there to kind of coach. Yes. So he's on the phone. So why, why would he want to bother you after you, uh, you talking about the Nephilim the Mother Project? I was... I was only ever supposed to know about if, you know, they always counted on me. If I got into counseling, it would always stay on the level of my surrogate parents because there were horrific things with my father, my grandfather, and in the Mennonite church there. So they counted on me always doing my counseling there, but they had a, you know, a backup. And the next layer, if something came undone, it was going to be with Mr. P. But as things kept going down lower, the, the, the closer we get down here, the more intense the, the accesses would get. Yeah. The threats, I mean, it, it, it didn't stop. Yeah, I know, you know, I remember so. that. Well, that, that's, um, I know there's so much more. Thank you for that. And um, um, I think I'll just move to, I think you're talking with Krista. She wanted to go with uh, Peter first, because Peter's her husband, and she could follow up. Uh, so we'll go to Peter, and I, I would just say that uh, it's really Providence that we came to, uh, to Syracuse. Um, of course, we met Jennifer Diane by being here and being able to do the work. Well, we first came to an assembly here, which I will not name, but it's well, a fundamental Christian assembly, right? And we come here because we just want to be in fellowship with other saints, and uh, we were there for a few months, and um, things began to transpire, and we're continuing to do our work here, and one of the Susanna recognizes uh, uh, some of the people there that are in the cult, okay? And these people are in leadership. Uh, one of the people in leadership is Peter's uh, father. And so the report was that uh, there's cult involvement, cult infiltration. 
Uh, I'll never forget Dan met one of the ladies who was one of the top leaders in this church in terms of uh, women's ministry. Right away, Dan says, that woman's a witch. You know, and I would confirm that you know, after, um, after meeting her myself. Uh, and, and she is touted the most godly woman in the assembly. Okay, so we were here, uh, and came to this assembly. We had to, they were asked to lead because we had identified key people and leaders in leadership uh, that were called involved. That couldn't be. This is a godly assembly. We all love God. We're all you know we're serving serving God's purpose. So this doesn't fit. We're all crazy liars or deceived, whatever you want to call it. So anyway, uh, we were asked to lead. And uh, we understand that it was probably a bit too much for them to bite off. But very interesting in God's providence, one of the elders uh, in this assembly, uh, his son, who was, who was Peter, um, began assembling our, uh, our, our church. And uh, he didn't know about this stuff in his past. As we began to work uh, with these people here, we could, be, we could find out that Peter's basically a handler. He is a bloodline representation of this new bloodline. He's right in the assembly with his wife, and they're there uh, to carry on an assignment. And uh, uh, and yet, God has a redemptive plan. I mean, he they're they're being used, uh, and and yet um, God brought them to us, and we're glad He did. Um, and then we we find out that of course, uh, Christ's father was trained by Dr. Joseph Mengele. And uh, the, the story just gets bigger and bigger, and it just kind of fits into the whole agenda that we understand. But Peter being a new, uh, uh, younger generation, um, how do you see, uh, Peter, your, you know, why you were selected for whatever purpose they had for you? And of course, it includes your marriage to Krista. Um, if you could just uh, address that, that would be really good to bring your perspective uh, to what it means for you to be a part of this whole end time agenda and program that Satan has orchestrated against so many of God's people. Um, well, my, what I can say about myself is a little bit uh, along the lines of what you know, Diana said and what Dan has said already that um, all this, all the generational iniquity, um, bloodline, or even, I mean, even non-bloodline stuff. So all the rituals, all the power that's been released through history, that's all aimed towards something. And like what I've been set up is at the base of me is just really just, uh, you know, just different terms. Like I call it like a, I'm just a door is what I say, or you know, you can call it a portal. Mm -hmm. Whatever, and it, it, some call it Stargate. Or, yeah, or Stargate. Um, basically, uh, to take everything that's been in the past, or everything that's even been in the future, and just kind of come through. Satan uses our humanity um, to come through me as a projection out um, over the nations, over the church, especially the main. Um, you know, his main target is the church, the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. So that's that's. Um, that's what I. That's what I would. I know myself to be um, is just something that takes the power and is used however Satan wants to use it in whatever particular moment, whether it be at a certain ritual where power needs to be released for a certain event, or just in general as a basic covering, as a basic web over the nations to just keep Christ out, basically to be, to be a separation uh, of. Christ from his body. That is mm -hmm. the main purpose that I've been used for. But when you say separate Christ from his, uh, his body, you grew up in this Christian assembly that was called infiltrated. Were you aware that there was some separation between Christ and his body, or did you just assume that what you knew was a connection with Christ? Uh, well, I grew up hearing that I was in the best church. I mean, I, I just. I just I grew up thinking I was in the best church and the best place that I could be and that this, every church should be like this church is how I kind of grew up and that's how I thought um, just because it's kind of the impression you get when you're there. So I grew up in that and I just assumed, well, this must be the best place. This must be um, what's, what's amazing. And it wasn't until I went to a church 
went to college and went to a different church out in Ohio, and I saw something different. Mm -hmm. I was like, there's, there's a lot, I mean, and even, uh, I mean, there, yeah, there was life. There was life there. I, I saw people, there were people getting saved every week. There you would go there, you would see people come to repentance there, like go down to repentance in the front. And I, and I said, I've never seen this. And, and, I, and I knew to the limited degree that it was even there, that it was more than anything I'd ever seen, that Christ was there expressed more than anything I've seen. So that just kind of got the ball rolling, like, well, I'm missing something, you know? What have I been missing? You know, like, clueless. I thought it was in the perfect place, in the perfect church. I thought I was a good Christian, and, you know? And then I realized something is not right, you know? <laughs> so this, you are to, to be a, kind of a veil of the church, you're not aware of that. There's a disconnect from the Lord, but you only know what you know. And looking back, you can see that that disconnect that you represent in terms of Isaiah, what, 25 or 7, being available to the nations, is in you, so whatever disconnect and separation there is from the, from God, and, you know, it's in you, but you don't even know it, because you know, that's all you know is uh, in terms of the environment you grew up in, which is cold and filtrated. I'm not saying it's all bad or there wasn't any Christian, because there are Christians there, we know them, we met them. Mm -hmm. But it's so insidious the way the enemy, as an angel of light, can bring this into the church and, and, and come off as Christianity. And it's projected, I mean, what you said, that, that denial, that deception, that uh, just completely unknowing is projected, you know, through me. And whatever strongholds there in myself, the way Satan is designed, like, has taken, really just stolen me, basically. But he uses that to spread out over the rest of the body of Christ. So it's like, it's, it's like based there in me. I mean, but it's, it's not just me. It's, it's coming from all generations, and it's like, Kind of converges like what she Diane was saying. It converges right there, and then it just shoots out okay. over over the rest of the body of Christ. So, yeah. so that's kind of the bloodline, and and just kind of a lead in. Uh, you just talk about okay, not God's reason because we know God's reason is, is the primary. But in terms of a cult agenda, why would they? Why did you marry uh, Krista? And then it is, then we can transition. And Krista can just pick up yeah. from there and share her part. She. Um, her and I are very linked. We have some, not exactly similar roles, because obviously me being a guy, I don't have the capacity to birth a Nephilim. But um, it's like she's my my link, really, to the Nephilim side of things. Yeah. So like... Um, Directly, we're, yeah. You know, we're, both, we're both used kind of together as this projection out. As this convergence, as everything comes into me, it also goes into her. Yeah. So we're kind of—I mean, we're one in that. Um, we're we're one, but we have slightly different roles in that oneness. Mm -hmm. Functions as it actually practical plays out. Yeah. Seeing as she's like a woman, and she has that connection to the Nephilim. Yeah. So. Okay. Oh, yeah. No, and, and I think too, you've heard all the others as they've shared their connection with this bloodline and this this whole crossover. So where do you fit in? and what you're aware of now in terms of what all shared, mm -hmm. but then there's you. There's, there, where do you well, fit in this? It's like I, I married into this new bloodline that you, your biological father represents. I've married into that. So I've become one with that, but, you know, and I've seen that as kind of a shield to me. I got to that first before I got to really who I was at a core level. And my actual bloodline, so that was really hidden and really hard to get to. <laughs> But um, just the fact that, that my biological father is Jewish. And I would have never known that, you know? Maybe and, he doesn't know it, huh? No, he doesn't know it right now, you know? I mean, all we know is we're outwardly, I knew that I was Norwegian, Swedish, you know, whatever, all this stuff. And I would never have anything to do with anything Jewish, you know? It's coming from like a, yeah, that kind of mentality, you know? Um, but just, because I'm more on the prophet side of things, which I would never have seen either. I more gravitated towards something else, you know, but I never, that was always so hidden in me, but just to realize that that was more my history, what I always didn't want to be, you know. So it's, so I have this Jewish father, but not only that, but there's these 13 kings of the earth, these 13 bloodlines that are spliced into who I am as well. So not only is it mainly Jewish, but there's this, 
whole splicing in of these 13 representations of the kings of the earth, all that comes into me. All those representations of all the bloodlines come into me. All this Jew on one side, Gentile on the other, the Jews and the Gentiles, that comes into me. It converges into me. Um, all the religions, you know, of the earth, I know that is not a your bloodline, but yeah, I mean, that representation comes into me as well. And what I wrote some things down, like the, the Old Testament and the New Testament, you know, different representations of different things I had seen as coming into me. Because I know Dan had started out talking about kind of the older generation, about um, just everything that came in through him as a conflu confluence and convergence, and then everything that's come in through all these women, all these temples that have came in, and colony, and all these other women, all these, um, their bloodlines, their templates, what they've been created to be, kind of, and it's all to bring in the Antichrist and the false prophets, it's all what they've been made to be, and then now what about this generation? It kind of comes down as we're coming closer and closer to the revealing of the Antichrist and the prophet. It all kind of converges and comes down and and you know, Peter talked about being the door. I feel like it's like that door is an opening into this generation. How he's been like a cap and a seal over all this. Everything comes down into this convergence in Peter, in me, on the prophet side, and then how that's linked into Diane on the, on the Antichrist side, you know. And it's like all these things have been from generations, just, you know, all the idolatry, from all the rituals, everything past, all the bloodlines, everything comes into one, into what I see is, in what I see in, in my role is just to, to bear and bring forth what I see as a representation of a false prophet. A hybrid. In this generation, a hybrid, yeah. Um, and so that's what I see my role and function is. I feel like, well, I don't feel like I know <laughs> I've been a cap over a lot of people, you know, and that's been real hard to see and know that I've been so one with this, like I've been so wrapped up in this, it wasn't just something that was put upon me, but it's something I totally identified with and I wanted, I didn't want, but I, I was so one with Satan and the bonds were so great that I, you know, I was fully one with their intentions, you know, bringing forth the Antichrist, revealing him and we're all towards that goal, but it's in the body of Christ, so there's, you know, he wants to bring forth his pure spotless bride, but there's all this idolatry going on, and there's all this dividedness inside ourselves. It is a oneness with the enemy. And, and I've been part of that. And I just confess that to everyone who's listening. You know, anyway, I've, like, been a cap over anyone, or, you know, a, kind of a, a veil of blindness over of church seeing this, or really anybody who's cult involved, who's a believer, seeing this as well and seeing and knowing their history, I've been a cap over that, you know. And what would project it come into me and project out as a veil, and I'm, I'm sorry for that, you know. And but as I come out, as I see things, I know it's really important to God and to the rest of the body of Christ. So that's why I go on, you know. You know, I don't think I would have ever known about this if it weren't for the Lord, like, extracting me and intervening in my life and bringing me to you guys, you and Lori, and everyone here, you know. Because um, for, for me, it's like I, I did, I knew something was wrong, but I didn't know what it was, you know. And that the Lord had to bring it out. The Lord had to do it, and he does, so. Um, but I guess... So yeah, just I don't know what else I could say, but just like to, you know, that all that kind of conversion to me, you know, and, and just however I was a bridge to bridge from that bloodline and everything that came into me and into that new bloodline that was represented by Diane and, and kind of coming out into everything could come into that one new bloodline that would represent. Me. And I think that's the common theme is that everything is leading up to that. Because whatever, uh, whatever the hybrids that come into being, and the, we, we won't go into this, but some of them are sacrificed, that spirit, it's like an evolving process uh, so that the final Antichrist is quintessential. I mean, it is the confluence of all the, uh, all the other hybrids so that the Antichrist and the false prophet, even among first generation hybrids, will be, you know, crown of the crown. They'll be the top of the line. 
the best that the adversary can produce. And, and this is all, the whole agenda is Revelation 19, 19, to create an army that will be on the battlefield in Armageddon to defeat God. And see, I think we Christians have to think about this. Well, that's ridiculous, and we, we know God's going to win. You don't, you don't understand a criminal mindset. You don't understand that the adversary is dead serious. And um, if you don't understand that, that, you know, what, two-thirds of the world's population will be killed before Jesus Christ returns. Where do I get that figure? Two-thirds of the Jews are going to die in the final Holocaust. Zechariah 13, 7-9. So if two-thirds of the Jews are going to die, and only one-third are going to pass through the fire and come into the millennial reign of Christ, why would there not be a two-thirds Gentiles? You add up all the plagues and everything that's going to happen in the, in the tribulation period, uh, in Revelation 6 to 18, uh, we're at the end game. It's, everything is in place. I remember working with Connie, we got to this part inside called Singularity. What are you? Go read Tom Horn's book on Singularity. She had all the information in her head, she hadn't even read Tom Horn's book. She was singularity. That's the whole point. This confluence is singularity. It is everything coming together in terms of technology, bloodlines, all this occult to produce quintessential man so that man can transition from where he is now, poor homo sapien, to come in homo universalis or homo noeticus and become that God-man, which is the goal of the Nazi uh, program uh, to bring in uh, Ubermensch, you know, the Superman, the Overman. And so, what this, these people were part of the project and, and God is bringing redemption. This is the thing, is that as these people are coming out, these internal layering of structuring is also represented in the second heavens. And in the second heavens you have these layers because it's dimensionally, you can be here and in the second heavens dimensionally through dissociation and trauma. So as, this, as you guys are doing this work, these layers are coming down, the shields are coming off, Job uh, 41, Leviathan, who is a mythopoetic reference to Satan, uh, Isaiah 27, 1, his shields are coming off. And that means his tenure over uh, planet Earth is being broken. And so um, you're a part of that. As you do the work, it's removing the shields of the adversary. We'll talk about more of that in South Africa. We can't do it here today. But um, I know this has been real brief, and I, uh, uh, I hopefully that this will be introductory. Uh, when we come back, we have a whole list of things we haven't covered. I'm going to go through them quite um, uh, as, as quickly as possible, just touching on them so we can get to the end, uh, which really personalizes your testimony as to uh, what does this mean to you as Christians? How do you relate to God through all this? And so you can really uh, personalize this, and I think that's what we'll work on. But um, uh, I think this would be a good place to break. So. Thank you all.